there are a lot of different AI use cases in healthcare and life sciences. And it currently is a pool of different use cases, and I'm just showing you uh, like maybe a surface of the, these different use cases. I will talk about these at a very high level. For example, at the management and hospital supports, you may be working on a conversational AI to automate responses to patient queries, or you may be wanting to have a system, an AI system to automatically monitor um, patient data, to monitor for adverse events, or you may be working on fraud detection to detect fraudulent claims or automate the claim processing, which will uh, really remove a lot of burden from the shoulders of the agents or people who are working and uh, at the hospital level or the management side. We also have use cases at the patient data analytics level and research and development. And there's, I think, a lot of overlap between these two areas as well. And these are all tools that are hopefully helping uh, doctors, nurses, other healthcare workers to uh, make quicker, faster, and better uh, decisions. For example, having a diagnostic system to be able to classify electronic health records into different category of diseases, or having a predictive tool to predict the disease uh, based on historic patient data is uh, something that is uh, very useful. Also, because there is a, this uh, wide uh, pool of articles, research uh, papers, or experimental studies uh, that is just not explored yet, and it would be really good to have an internal document tagging platform as well, and also to de-identify some of these documents because these patient record data are uh, private and uh, you cannot just use them in your research or other production level analysis, and they need to be first de-identified. There's also many uh, different use cases for clinical trial analysis and patient matching as well. And also uh, for drug discovery, uh, we, we may be interested in extracting links between drugs and diseases. Or uh, for genomics level, we may be interested in uh, exploring associations between drugs or chemicals on genes. Medical image analysis is a field very close to my heart because I've been working on this field and uh, it's another very big uh, area. Uh, that, for example, you want to know and predict bone fracture or like predict uh, skin cancer or predict brain disease, etc. And we also have personalized medicine. So this is just a very maybe touching on the surface of different use cases in healthcare and life sciences. If there are other use cases you're working on and you're currently very passionate about, please feel free to uh, show that and talk about them in the chat. But yes, there are many different use cases happening in healthcare and life sciences. And uh, these data exist in different institutions, companies, uh, hospitals. Uh, however, sometimes it's hard to uh, build an AI application uh, that is really uh, able to capture all these different uh, pool of information from this data set so that we can automate uh, many of these use cases. And data has become the blocker. And uh, the reason is that currently uh, we have access uh, to really high performance and state of the art models compared to before where the models weren't that good. But now we know that there are really good models out there and with only writing uh, some lines of Python code, you'll have access to the best of the models out there. And we really have a good access to infrastructure. You can just request uh, from a cloud provider to just give you a number of CPUs and GPUs that you need, and you will have access to that. However, one of the biggest blocker right now is to have access to a really good and clean label training data so that we can use that to train uh, our machine learning models um, into our own infrastructure of interest. So now this has become the blocker, having access to good and high quality, clean training data. And um, not only that, but also the development process is iterative and it's just not a one-time process. Given that you have your training data labeled, you may want to uh, train your machine learning model, but that's not the end of it. You cannot just deploy the solution. You have to uh, figure out and analyze your model, figure out where the model is making a mistake, address those uh, model errors, or there may be some changes in your uh, upstream objectives of the business. For example, you may change your uh, classes, number of classes, changing the class definitions, or maybe there is a change or a drift in, in your data set. For example, when COVID-19 hit, we saw that there is a lot of change in the data set that is coming in in different use cases. So it is not a one-time process. It is a development uh, tool that is iterative. And uh, you need to be able to have the possibility to go back and make improvements uh, on your training data as well. 
So uh, we have seen that there has been a shift uh, towards data-centric AI compared to model-centric AI, meaning that we want to put the training data at the center of our development. Uh, meaning that we want to first be able to label the data and then uh, use the machine learning model uh, to uh, with this training data to uh, train it and then analyze the results of the model and do this in an iterative manner. And uh, the problem is that we are most of the time bottlenecked by the manual data labeling time. So currently, there are two ways uh, we can uh, label the data manually. The first one is to outsource it to labeling vendors. And there are some issues with that. First of all, uh, these patient records or data set are private. You don't want to just uh, outsource them outside. And also, uh, the vendors may not may lack the domain expertise uh, to really label them appropriately. And this is not auditable or governable. You don't know how this labeling was actually performed and whether it's consistent or not. And it's really hard to adapt. And the second approach is to label with in-house experts. And uh, aside using the active learning model assisted labeling, it may be slow. And um, it, it is a high opportunity cost of domain experts. They are very expensive and they could spend their time doing some other important things. And uh, again, it's not auditable, it's not governable, and it's very hard to adapt. So uh, before jumping to what uh, Snorkel is and the approach, I uh, wanted to say that Snorkel uh, was pioneered, uh, has pioneered the data-centric AI approach uh, over seven plus years at Stanford AI Lab. And it has been published in 60 plus academic papers and the technology has been deployed by a lot of um, US banks, uh, pharma companies, health insurance companies, uh, et cetera. So uh, the way Circle Flow works is that it unlocks the complete data-centric AI development workflow. So training data is at the center of our development and uh, we will be able to programmatically label data. So th this whole platform gives the opportunity for the data scientists and the subject matter expert to efficiently collaborate together and inject the knowledge of the subject matter expert in terms of labeling functions. Or these labeling functions could be simple rules, simple heuristics, or more uh, complex models. However, by writing and injecting these knowledge in terms of labeling function, you would be able to label data 10 to 100 times faster. And after that, uh, with the concept of weak supervision, uh, on top of these programmatic labels, you will be able to train another machine learning model because at the end of the day, you want to deploy a model uh, in, into your platform. So that will be used to, um, uh, for, that can be used for inferencing. So this machine learning model is then used to uh, uh, analyze the results because we want to have this iteration to find out why the model is making some mistake. Is it the model that we have to improve on or is it the data that we have to improve on? And if it's the data, what part of the data do we have to go back and make improvements on? So this is an uh, iterative process. And um, as soon as we're happy with the final results of the model, then we can just deploy it in our infrastructure. So I'll now talk about two case studies uh, that we have done uh, with customers. Uh, the first one is with Genetech. Um, Genetech is working a lot with uh, clinical trial process and documents. And um, really, um, it is uh, very time consuming to go through all of these documents and draw insights from them. Uh, specifically in this case, uh, Genetech want, wanted to use AI to extract named entities. And these entities refer to chronic conditions. And uh, what it referred to was to be able to extract uh, all mentions of diseases from inclusion and exclusion criteria so that they would uh, later on be able to say, give me all the clinical trials that mentioned hepatitis B in the inclusion criteria, for example. In order to develop an AI model to do this task and train an AI model, they needed to have enough training data and in order to get to that training data, it was very hard. It, they were blocked by that because labeling this training data took a lot of time of the domain experts and there was an inability to outsource this data as well. And they had estimated that if they wanted to do, do it themselves, it would take them 140 person months to manually label enough training data to be able to um, train this AI model. 
However, with snorkel flow, uh, they were able to build a, an AI application with more than 99% uh, accuracy. So the, the way they could do that was having this uh, domain experts with the data scientists write and inject the, the expertise as labeling function. And uh, this uh, basically intelligence was applied on mass to the data set. So by writing these labeling functions, they were able to uh, train and uh, label 340,000 documents, which would have been impossible to just label them by hand. And uh, the other thing is that in the middle of the process, they discovered that instead of, for example, having 15 entities to extract, they were interested in extracting 21 entities instead of needing to go back and label everything from beginning and from scratch, they were able to just relabel and change the label schema in just uh, only one day. This is the first case of study. And the second one that I want to talk about is on Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, one of the oldest and largest uh, cancer centers in the US. And the challenge was to have an AI model that was able to predict who is at the risk of developing melanoma. So for this task, again, um, uh, MSKCC uh, is very interested in uh, improving the quality of life, and it is very critical to have early intervention. However, a large number of uh, good information is buried into these reports, and it's really hard to just extract all of them. And in order for uh, getting to this task and building this AI application to predict who are the patients that are at risk, um, they needed enough uh, training data to build this AI application. However, time to label training data was really slow given the high degree of uh, domain expertise that was needed, and uh, if there was an inability to outsource as well. And the task was complex, so they could just couldn't write rules-based uh, solutions. They would conflict or they, they wouldn't be able to capture enough um, signal from the data set. And also the other thing was that the expert labels were inconsistent. So um, this disagreement in expert labels was also uh, something that proved to be hard to govern the labels. So, and they also estimated that in order to get to thousand label reports, uh, it was really uh, impossible because it would just take three weeks to label around 150 documents. So with snorkel flow, they were uh, able to build an application uh, that achieved an, uh, more than 85 F1 score only in one week. And they were able to reduce the amount of time to label training data by 80%. And this was just all done by the capability of writing and getting programmatic labels to uh, label complex and domain specific text. And uh, also uh, snorkel flow will manage and denoise all of these different labeling functions that are captured by the subject matter experts. And one other interesting fact was that throughout this process and uh, development, iterative development, they figured that around 15% of the ground truth labels were flawed. So they figured that, okay, they have to uh, go back and make uh, some corrections because at the beginning, there were some inconsistencies among the experts themselves in uh, giving out the ground truth uh, label as well. So I will now show you some of these uh, example use cases and labeling functions in practice and how, they, how these feel like, look like, and uh, different types. This doesn't uh, really capture all different types, but I, I will just uh, touch on a few. Uh, these four applications, the first one is on PDF extraction, and the second one is on named entity recognition, third one will be on text extraction, and then lastly, I will just touch on uh, the ontologies like ICD-10 codes that uh, is used a lot in uh, different medical term terminologies. So the first one is on procedure extraction. For this task, the input was PDFs that included clinical trial protocol documents. These documents could be 300 pages long, and each P PDF has different tables, P uh, text, or images. And what we were interested in building was to have an application that was able to extract procedures from these uh, schedule of activities tables. And you can assume that we have uh, lots of PDFs, and these are lots of pages. They could be uh, different wide variety of formats and shapes, and it's really hard to just go and label these. So we started with this application even without any ground truth and just uh, labeled 
three or four documents in the platform um, to have a ground truth aside so that we could test and validate the performance of the model. But we can have tens and thousands of these documents that are unlabeled, but will be programmatically labeled by the approach uh, of Circle. So I will now show you that even if you have a scanned PDF or a native PDF, they can be ingested in Snorkel flow and will be converted to our own internal representation, which we'll call rich docs. And what happens is that it will ma maintain all the structure in the document and the tables, meaning that you will see what is appearing in the same row, what is in the row before, what is in the same column. We have all this information also outputted from all of these uh, words uh, for, or text clusters. So you see that we have two colors right now. The purple one means that these are spans or text clusters that we're not interested in. And the blue ones are the ones that we're interested in extracting. These are the procedures, like uh, what are the demographics, what are the medical history or other, like whether there was a blood draw or not. These, these are procedures and this is what we wanna extract. And you can assume that if I wanted to extract them by hand and label them, that would be really time consuming. But I can start writing labeling functions to extract these. One type of labeling function is to look at what is in the same row. For example, if the X, letter X is in the same row, probably that's a procedure. And uh, you can also chain these different labeling functions. For example, you can have a rule or a logic and then chain it with another logic and say that if it's in the same row as X, but it itself is not X, then label it as class procedure. This is just one approach. We can also have other approaches, for example, say anything that is on the right of the table is probably not a procedure because procedures are the ones that appear on the left side of the table. And Snorkel will also help us figure out what is the best threshold to say that anything after this part, let's say that this is not a procedure and label that as class other. As you can see, we also get some metrics like precision and coverage to tell us how good of a labeling function this is. And it's fine that these labeling functions do not need to be perfect. They can be 70% correct, 60%, 80%. At the end of the day, circle flow will uh, denoise all of these different labeling functions. So this is uh, for the first uh, application. And the second one, I wanted to talk about named entity recognition or in this task, uh, recognizing mentions of chemicals and genes. This has been performed on a public data set called drug prot, where we want to extract mentions of chemicals, gene Y and gene N, which are two different uh, entities for genes. So the input is a medical text, is basically a title and the abstract of a medical journal paper. And as the output, we want to have this highlighted text that shows what part of the text uh, has a mention of gene Y or chemical or a gene N. So this is a named entity recognition task. And on the top right, uh, there is this text that has been just in circle flow. I have shown an annotation pane that's for sodium. Uh, I have highlighted it. It is purple, meaning that it has been given the uh, label of chemical. And you can also go ahead and highlight any of these tokens that you seem is necessary to give a specific label as well. I wanted to say that in circle flow, you'll have access to lots of different models. For example, we can use the spacey that has already been trained. And we can use the part of speech tagging to say that whatever that is tagged with a verb or a determiner or an auxiliary is probably not any of these um, entities that we are interested in. So we can just label that as class other, because whatever else that is not colored in this text uh, is uh, in this text is basically class other or what we are not interested in. And then the second labeling function I wanted to talk about is that we also have access to a pool of different medical transformers. In this text on the bottom right, you see that there is a box uh, around some of these purple uh, highlights. And uh, this is because I have applied BioBird to this te uh, uh, text. And whenever BioBird said that um, there is a chemical in this text, then uh, it would just, uh, it would be uh, like formatted as a labeling function. For example, it says dopamine is a chemical, it is the output of the BioBird. And we're just using that as one source of labeling function or information here. You can see that Na, which is probably sodium, has not been labeled by BioBird, but it's fine. We can also use other types of medical transformers or other types of labeling functions, such as keyword-based or dictionary-based, uh, to be able to label these different kind of entities in the text. 
I've also used clinical birds and craft birds, which, uh, which are bird transformers that uh, are trained on other data set. And you can all bring all those in and use those as sources of information here as well. So we have access to all these different hugging face models, or even if you have a custom model in-house, you can use them here as one source of labeling function or your final uh, machine learning model. And then next, I wanted to talk about this fact extraction and verification task, which has been applied on the COVID fact data set. Basically, the input is that we have a claim regarding COVID, and then we have five documents related to this claim. The output we want to get is to get the five most relevant sentences to this claim, and then say whether this claim was supported or refuted by this uh, relevant documents. So for this task, I wanted to show you that on the right, we see that we have the claim and we have the evidence and uh, how can we write uh, basically labeling functions in order to do this task. First of all, we have access to NLTK um, sentiment tools that will find out the polarity of these different texts. So if the, for example, polarity of the claim is uh, positive, if the polarity of the evidence text is negative, then we, we could assume that these have opposite sentiments. So this evidence is not supporting the claim. So we could just label that as class reviewed. And again, you see that the precision is not 100%, which is totally fine. You can click on view correct or view incorrect and see where are the places that it's making the correct prediction, why it is making an incorrect, incorrect prediction, and make improvements there as well. So we have access to these different sentiment tools. And also wanted to mention that uh, we can calculate the SNOMED lexicons in these uh, texts. For example, we know that we have a SNOMED lexicon dictionary and we can calculate uh, how much of these lexicons appeared in the claim, how much of those appeared in the evidence, and uh, calculate the overlap and say that if the overlap of these uh, lexicons is less than a specific threshold, then probably this evidence does not support the claim, and then we can use that and refute that. So this is one other way of uh, writing a uh, labeling function for class refute. And then lastly, I also wanted to talk about ICD-10 codes, similar to SOMED that I showed you. We can have a span ICD-10 builders, meaning that if in the text there is a span that is corresponded to any of these ICD-10 codes, for example, in this case, we're saying that if you have an M06 or M19 code appearing in the text, then label that as class arteritis. You can see in the text, this blue uh, highlighted text refers to one of these codes, and then hence it's labeled as arteritis. So uh, let me say that um, Snorkelflow is also enterprise ready, it's fully interoperable, and uh, there are uh, support for different uh, data types. For example, your input could be either text documents, it could be native or scanned PDFs. It could be HTML files, uh, conversational text, uh, tabular data, numeric or network data. And uh, some of the ML tasks that we support are document classification, information extraction, conversational analysis, and structured data classification, among other things. And uh, today our focus is uh, on healthcare and pharma, but we also support other industries as well. Also wanted to say that Snowflow integrates easily with our existing ML stack, meaning that we have uh, the data could be coming into different variety of formats like CSV, Parquet file, and we also have connectors to Snowflake and SQL. And could the final output could, uh, could be served on MLflow and uh, as a SageMaker or other variety of formats. And the way Snowflow is hosted could be either on our own cl uh, cloud or on uh, your own private or public cloud or on your uh, premises, on your Kubernetes uh, premises. Well, that was the end of my presentation, and thanks, everyone. And uh, we can take a look at the questions. Well, we're waiting for a few questions to come in, Nazanin. Uh, one of the common questions we get, um, you know, what happens when two labeling functions conflict? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, basically, you can write a different number of labeling functions. Uh, they can conflict. And uh, sometimes uh, the, um, what happens in the platform is that all of these different conflicts and agreements and disagreements between these uh, labeling functions are taken into account by the algorithms developed by our founders in the platform. So at the end of the day, they will be denoised. So you will know that like which uh, labeling function to weight more or which labeling function to be weighed less. And uh, at the end, you will get one final uh, outcome or a label. 
And you can, in the platform, say that you trust this labeling function more than the other one. So there is also another approach to say whether you trust it or not. But you don't need to um, uh, wonder about like whether why why is it um, conflicting or not. They will all be taken care of in the platform. So I don't see any other questions um, coming in. So I will thank the audience and thank you again, uh, Nazanin, for. Uh, the wonderful presentation. 